Colossians chapter 1. If you'd remain standing for the reading of the word, that would be wonderful. Amen. Colossians chapter 1, and we'll begin with verse 3. It says, We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love which ye have to all the saints, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth, as ye also learned of Ephesus, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Amen. I want you to speak this morning about the miracle of the gospel. The miracle of the gospel. God, I thank you today. Thank you for every person that's come into the house of the Lord. And God, I thank you, Lord, for the gospel that has already been evident in people's lives and the change that has happened in people's hearts. And God, I pray some someone this morning that may need to hear about this wonderful gospel and how powerful it is. God, I pray you'd minister through your word this morning. And God, we're asking, God, for the direction that you've given us for this service today, that your will would be accomplished, God, and your power and spirit would be seen, and a testimony of your miracle-working power would be evident, God, because of this service this morning. And I asked it in the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Uh, The book of Colossians, Paul is, 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 he's a great encourager, a great encourager. The epistle is, is a good example of being thankful and how God has done great things in a person's life, and how you can encourage someone through what God has done through your life. In the, in the book of Colossians, Paul is writing this book from jail. And so uh, he mentions uh, six or seven times in the book of Colossians about being thankful and Thanking God for what he's done in his life. Now, even in the situation that Paul is in, he's still being very thankful for what God has done. It, it wouldn't be an easy situation, I wouldn't think. I have no idea exactly what Paul faced while he was in prison. But we, we know without a doubt he didn't have the liberty and freedom he would have had if he was not. And so Paul shows a gratefulness to what God has done in his life and how that can also be shown in the lives of other people. And as Christians, that we're all members of that same body, the church. And we can strengthen each other with talking and speaking and sharing about the miracle of the gospel. And what Paul does is he uses different stages of that spiritual experience uh, in, the, in the book of Colossians to, to put across this wonderful truth. First of all, he speaks in the passage that we have read, and he speaks about how they heard about the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ. See, the good news of the gospel was it was not native to Colossia. It was not native to that city. It had been brought to them. And in the case of the fellow servant that is mentioned, Ephesus, he was the messenger. He was himself a citizen of Colossia. But he had come in contact with Paul on one of his missionary journeys, probably during the three-year missionary journey at Ephesus. And God had changed his life. And he changed his life in such a way that he had to go back to where he was from And tell them about Jesus. He shared the thrilling news about what Jesus had done in his life with his relatives, his friends, the people 
of Colossia. He shared that good news that Jesus had solved his problem of sin through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The good news, the gospel, was what was being shared with, with each and every person in that city. Unfortunately, some people, when they come to the gospel and, and witness the gospel and talk about the gospel, it comes across in a condemnation way instead of a good news way. The gospel is not condemning. The Bible is very clear that Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The, the gospel, the good news, is not to come across in condemnation or condemning. It's, it's not to be shared like a prosecuting attorney about how uh, everything is wrong or how everything that has been brought forward as mistakes or, or what the, the evidence is of how someone has faltered or, or is lacking in their life. That's not about the gospel. The gospel is this is what Jesus can do for you and this is where Jesus can take you through the powerful message of the good news of the death burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If we're not careful, we can get into looking at the negative aspects of people's lives instead of what the gospel can do. The miracle of the gospel. The miracle of the gospel. See, Paul reviews some characteristics of this exciting gospel message in this passage. First of all, who it centers around. It centers around Jesus Christ. The theme of the epistle is the preeminence of Jesus Christ. He is certainly preeminent in the gospel. The gospel is not what I can tell you and share with you and how I can help you as an individual. That is maybe good to a certain extent, but that's not the gospel. The gospel is centered around the preeminence of, of Jesus Christ. Not another person sitting in this congregation. Not another person in their abilities or talents. The gospel is centered around Jesus. See, the gospel message does not center around philosophy or a certain doctrine or a religious system. It doesn't center around those things. It doesn't center around a building or a church or a location or, or an organization even as such. It doesn't center around a certain pastor. It doesn't center around a certain group of people. It only has one person in the center, and that is Jesus Christ. As soon as he comes out of the center, people's lives are not changed the way he desires. The miracle of the gospel is when Jesus Christ is in the center of what we talk about. If we're not careful, we can talk about ourselves. When we get into witnessing, when we get into sharing, when we, we can talk about ourselves, what we've done, what we haven't done. What, no, 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 that's not the gospel. The gospel is what Jesus has done for me. The gospel is what Jesus has done through me. The gospel is what Jesus can do for you. The gospel is centered around Jesus Christ. Verse 5 tells us that it is also around the word of truth. This means that it came from God and can be trusted. The word is truth. See, there are many messages and ideas that can be called true. Lots of things can be called true. But only God's word can be called the truth. It, the focus comes around, well, uh, is, 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 is this what to really happened in a person's life? Don't worry about what's true about the person. Worry about what's true about the truth. Man, that was like, just fell on. Let me tell you, if you don't know what the truth is, you won't know what to stand for. You've got to know that this word is truth or you'll fall for anything. 
Get yourself uh, centered on Jesus Christ uh, and make sure you stay in the truth. What is truth? It's not just simple things that are true. The truth is the word of God. See, men have tried to destroy God's truth for years and years, hundreds and thousands of years. People have tried to destroy the truth, but they failed. One certain individual, his whole purpose in life was that the Bible would not be the Bible would not be copied any longer, repeated, sold. What was so interesting about his life is when he passed away, his house became a printing shop for the Word of God. Isn't it interesting? God has such a sense of humor. Someone that would try to stop the truth. Hallelujah. His, his actual house became a printing shop. See, everything and everybody has faith in something. And by faith, it's, it's what are you going to put your faith in? Something that's just true or you're going to put it in the truth? Faith is only as good as the object in which a person puts their trust. See, the jungle pagan worships a god of stone. The educated city worships maybe money and possessions or status. But in both cases, the faith is empty. But when a true believer puts their faith in Jesus Christ and in the word of God, their faith is not built on superstition. Their faith is not built on something that's just a possibility. No, no, no. Their faith is built on truth. Truth. And it's truth that can save. It's truth that brings the miracle of the gospel. When it's centered on Jesus Christ and it's from the word of God, there is something powerful about the gospel. Oh, I'm thankful for programs and I'm thankful for nice buildings and I'm thankful for upkeep and and how we do things and, and, and how we want to do things great. I'm thankful for all that. But that doesn't save anybody. We can have the perfect temperature, and we can have the perfect seating, and we can have the perfect sound, and we can have the perfect this and that in which we want to do the best we can. But that doesn't save anybody. It still has to be centered on Jesus Christ and the truth. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Next, it's the message of God's grace. In verse 6. He ends it with saying, since the day he heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. The message of God's grace. See, there's two words in the Christian vocabulary that oftentimes are confused. Grace and mercy. God in his grace gives me what I do not deserve. That's what his grace did. His grace gave me what I did not deserve. I deserved death. The wages of sin is death. But he gave me what I didn't deserve. He gave me the opportunity for eternal life. He gave me the opportunity to live for him. Grace, grace is what he gives me that I do not deserve. His mercy is does not give me what I do deserve. Each day that I live for God, after I've come in contact with His grace, I'm so far from perfect. And I'm so so, uh, apt to make mistakes and, and have failures, but His mercy does not give me what I do deserve. His grace gave me what I didn't deserve, and His mercy keeps me saved. See, grace is God's favor that's shown to an undeserving sinner. The reason that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ has changed my life is because of His grace. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves. 
It wasn't that of yourselves. It is the gift of God. See, God is willing and able to save all of us. It's not his will to repentance. Whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's something about Jesus that he wants to save everybody. But the center has got to be on him. It's got to be built on truth. And you must experience his grace. It's the miracle. It's the miracle of the gospel. Amen. The next characteristic of that wonderful gospel message is also mentioned in verse 6. It says, which is come unto you as it is in all the world. It's not just for a certain group of people. It's for all the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever should believe on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you could come up with a gift to give everybody in the world, what would it be? If you could come up with a particular gift, well, you could say, I, I want everyone to have books so they could be more intelligent. But not everybody can actually even read. Well, I would want to make sure everybody has food. But there's different things that people like in different parts of the world. People eat a lot of different things. Well, I would make sure they had clothing, but do you know what? Climates are actually different in different parts of the world. <laughs> they don't need in Africa, what you need here in February. Well, maybe it would be money, but not every culture even uses money or has the same value for money. See, the logical conclusion of the best gift that can be given to every person is the power of eternal life, the good news of the gospel, because it doesn't matter where they're from, what culture, what language, what tribe or tongue, the gospel works. The miracle of the gospel is for everybody. Everybody has a right to experience that wonderful gospel. Paul said that the gospel was bearing fruit in all the world. The word of God, the only seed that can be planted anywhere, anywhere in the world and bear fruit. The gospel can be preached to, the Bible says, every creature which is under heaven. Paul, Paul's emphasis was that every person, chapter 1 and 28, whom we preach warning every man, that every person would get to hear the miracle working power of the gospel. You say, Pastor, we, we've heard this before. We, we know this already. It's the only thing that works. It's the only thing that works. It's the only thing that changes somebody. It's the only thing that lasts. It's the only thing that got you to where you are today was the power of the gospel. It's not a new recipe. There's not some new recipe. The Bible says in verse 4 that they believed in Jesus Christ. Do you know it is possible to hear and not believe? See, even though the word of God has the power to generate faith in those that hear, millions of people have heard and yet have not believed. But those who believe... In Jesus Christ receives something. There's something that takes place. There's a miracle working power that is demonstrated in their life. So it's not just so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's a starting point. But there is a believing that activates your faith that causes you to obey and to experience the gospel. 
of Jesus Christ. It's more than just a hearing. See, we're not saved by faith in faith. There is a cult of believism today that if you just believe, you're going to be okay. That's, that's, that's like having faith in faith. The obvious question is, believe in what? It's not that you just believe. What are you believing in? What, what, what is it that your belief is in? Because it can only be centered around one person. It can only be centered around the truth. It has to have an experience of grace. It's for everybody. What is it that you and I are believing in? It's not, to, it's not that we are saved just by some set of doctrines. I'm glad for the doctrine, obviously. It's true. It's part of truth. But it's, it's not just believing in something. What is it that you and I are believing in? There was an evangelist, George Whitfield, Whitefield. He, who, he was witnessing to a man, and he said, what do you believe? Whitefield asked, the man replied, I believe what my church believes. And Whitefield said, what does your church believe? What I believe, replied the man. <laughs> Undaunted, Whitefield tried again and asked, and what do you both believe? Why, we both believe the same thing. It's kind of an evasive reply to not having a clue. What is it that you and I believe in? Because it's not enough just to believe. I can believe that peanut butter is great with fresh homemade bread. But it's not enough to believe it. I want to experience it. I want a good coat of it, thick. See, it's not enough just to say you believe in something. What is your belief when it comes to the gospel? Is it the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Is it centered on Him? Is it centered on the truth? Is it centered on the grace of God that changes your life? <laughs> See, saving faith involves three things. It involves the mind, the emotions, and the will. With the mind, we understand the truth of the gospel. With the, will, with the, the emotions, the heart, we feel conviction. And those two things are wonderful because that saving faith, it has to go through our mind where we understand that I need him. I have to change. I have a lack in my life. And my emotions is affected by conviction. And I realize that I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. But it's only when we exercise the will and we commit ourselves to Christ that it actually completes the process of the gospel. So our mind can know that I need to believe in something that's true. And the conviction can happen in my life. And it affects me at that moment. But unless I, I, I make a, a step towards God with my will, I will not experience the miracle of the gospel. And that's why people can come into the house of God and feel conviction, yet their lives are not changed because their will is not more powerful. So when you come into the house of God and your will says, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to take this step. I'm going to rise out of my seat. And I'm going to experience the miracle of the gospel. There is absolutely nothing that can hold you back from experiencing what God has in that miracle. 
Amen. Doesn't matter what you've been through. Doesn't matter where you came from. Doesn't matter what your week was like. Your will exercised commits to the process of the gospel. See, faith is not is not mental assent to a body of doctrines. No matter how true those doctrines are, you can know what they are. You can even be emotionally connected to them. But faith is when you make a commitment through your will. I am going to allow the gospel to change my life. Huh. See, false teachers had come to Colossae and they tried to undermine the saints' faith in Christ and his word. Same type of thing that's happening today. All kinds of people are trying to undermine what is happening through Jesus Christ. Trying to dethrone him as the centerpiece of the gospel. That salvation can be some, through some other experience. And, and that it can happen some other way. It doesn't happen any other way. It's not enough to have a good feeling. It's not enough to experience a tingle. It's not enough to be emotionally affected by a service. No, the experience of a believer is when they allow the power of the gospel to change their life. What it does is it you, you, you won't be able to remain silent. It, it won't allow you. To hide it. No, no. What happened with Ephraim? See, he said, oh, no, i got to go back to Colossia. I've got to tell them of this powerful demonstration that happened in my life and, and how my life has been changed. And, and Paul says, listen, take your fellow servant and listen to him. Listen to what has happened. He didn't, he didn't just simply lead the... Colossians to Christ and then abandoned them. No, he taught them the word. He established them in their faith. The word that's used in 1 Colossians 1 and 7, the translated learned. It's, it's the same word for a disciple. It's the same word that Jesus used when he said, learn of me or become my disciple. Ephraim was a faithful minister, but he not only won people to Christ, he taught them the word of God, and he helped them grow, and he prayed for them. And when they're in danger, he warned them. He loved them. He protected them. He made sure that he just continued to let them see how powerful the gospel was in their life. The word disciple is found more than 260 times in the gospel in the book of Acts. The word, the verb that's translated to learn as a disciple is found over 25 times in the New Testament. It's so important that when we experience that gospel, that we grow in, in listening and living and looking and, and learning the things of God. And we just become closer to Him than we've ever been. It would be similar to maybe... Uh, an apprenticeship or medical students of the modern day where they go and they learn uh, uh, on the job. It's, it's, it's about being with Jesus all the time where we find ourselves that we put him in the center of our life and he stays right there and we're learning about him, the truth, uh, and we've experienced his grace and we just got to share it with everybody. It's the miracle of the gospel. They became so faithful to God the Word of God. The Word of God that has life. The Word of God that's planted, that can produce fruit. You see it in verse 6 of this Colossians chapter 1. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. And when God's Word is planted and cultivated, it produces something in our life. It produces faith and hope and love, as you notice that is mentioned in these few verses that we've read to you this morning. That, that faith, hope, and love is a, is a product. It's a result of that miracle of the gospel. See, faith comes through hearing the word of God. Our Christian life starts with saving faith, but that's only the beginning. We learn to walk by faith, and we work by faith, and, and we pray through the power of faith. And Faith is a shield that protects us from the, the fiery darts of the enemy. 
It's a growing in our faith because of the power, the miracle of the gospel. Love is another evidence of true salvation. An unsaved person can easily wrap themselves up in themselves. But the fact of a person that's come in contact with the miracle of the gospel, that, that changes. Or it's supposed to. Christian love is not a shallow feeling that can be manufactured. No, Christian love is by the power of the Spirit. You notice it in verse 8 when he said, Who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. The power of the Holy Ghost generates something in our lives that there's not some manufactured love that we put on when we're in front of people. The power of the miracle of the gospel gives us a true love. He says in verse 4, for all the saints. Oh, well, let's read it. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which he had to all the saints. Not just the ones you're compatible with. Not just the ones that you really like. No, the power of the miracle of the gospel is that there's a love for all the saints. The fellowship, the realizing the vastness of God's love and how you share that with believers. Paul goes on in Colossians 2 and 2 and he says, it is it's something that knits you together in love. The power of the gospel knits us together. Not just a few strings or twines here or there. No, no, we're, we're knit together. That's the miracle of the gospel. The bond that unites us in love, Paul says in chapter 3 and 14. See, disunity, uninformity is the result of the outside. Unity is the result of what God has done through our life on the inside. So you have faith and you have love. And you have hope that is a characteristic of the believer. Unsaved people are without hope. They're without hope because they are without God. The outside of Christ, there is, outside of Christ, there is no hope. See, in the Bible, hope doesn't mean hope so. No, no, no. It's, that's not what it means. There's a definite and an assurance that comes because of the miracle of the gospel. When it comes to hope. Colossians 1 and 27. He says it's the hope of glory. There's an assurance that comes. Through the miracle of the gospel. The gospel gives you a hope. That is far beyond this life. Certainly more than you could ever imagine. That God has given to you. Is through hope. The miracle of the gospel. Helps you not worry about tomorrow. It gives you what Titus said is a blessed hope. A blessed hope. So here's, here's what happens. The miracle of the gospel is centered in Jesus Christ. It's built upon the word of God, which is the truth. It is experienced through the grace of God which is not what we deserve. And it is to all the world. Everybody is able to receive it. And the gospel that everybody can receive, everybody, it allows us to have faith, love, and hope. Faith in something way beyond this. This life, faith is the substance of things hoped for. And the evidence of things not seen. You don't even need to be able to understand everything. But you got faith because of the miracle of the gospel. There's a faith that's built in you that causes the church to love each other. To love the world. To love our city. To love our community. To love our families. To love our neighbors. To love our fellow workers. To love our enemies.
like to know what my face looks on the line right now. I'll get to see it later. I hate watching myself. But it gives you a love. And that love takes you to a hope. A hope, folks, that's way beyond today. This is the miracle of the gospel. Mm. And what's so awesome about that miracle is it still works. It has never got old. I thank God for salvation. I thank God that he forgave me of my sin. I, I, I thank God for being baptized in his wonderful name. It's coming up very soon. It will be 40 years in October since I was baptized in the name of Jesus in the cold Cushpaquack River on October the 22nd. I thank God for being baptized in his precious name. I thank God for the infilling of the Holy Ghost that I received in March of 1976. I thank God for the miracle of the gospel. Because it's allowed me to increase in faith and hopefully in love. And I hold on to a hope. What are you believing in today? What is your belief in? Is it something that will last? Is it life changing? Is it true? Is it settled? Is it for sure? Is it just a belief? Or do you just believe what the church believes and they believe what you believe and we both believe the same thing? No, I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded there's something deep inside of me that knows without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, where is your belief today? Is it in the miracle of the gospel? That miracle of the gospel is life changing. And I thank God for it. Hmm, right now. Could you stand with me? Sister Stewart, would you come up with me please? Brother Robertson. I'll come on to the love of Shanda. Hallelujah. I want you to take this, Sister Stewart. We're going to anoint this handkerchief today. And we're going to have Sister Stewart take this to her daughter in law who needs a divine miracle. But I will tell you, last night, Sister Stewart, as I was at that hospital, the power of God was in that room. And we stood. And we held hands and prayed in the spirit. What's so awesome about God? He never leaves. And so we're going to bind together right now for a divine healing. For Kim, would you do that right now? In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. God, the power of the gospel. God, in your miracle working power, our faith, our hope is in you this morning. God, let your healing virtue reach down and minister to her. God, let her know the prayers of the church. And God, what we told her last night that we would do this morning as we would pray together. And God, allow your mighty power to minister to her. Oh, God, let it be a testimony of your miracle-working power. In the name of Jesus, we pray. God, I pray for Matt. God, I pray for the, the daughter and son. God, the grandkids. Oh, God, let your power and your spirit reach down and minister to them this morning. In the name of Jesus, I pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Oh, God, we love you and thank you today. We praise you and worship you this morning. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord gave me explicit instructions, Sister Stewart. I want you to tell her to put it underneath her pillow. And you keep that, tell her to keep it right underneath her pillow. In the name of Jesus. 
The power of the gospel. Music come. It still works. It still matters. It still changes people's lives. Hallelujah. It's still the only recipe that's actually needed. Everybody that's in this building this morning, you either have experienced it or you need to. No one excluded. It's for everybody. And that miracle is based upon centering around Jesus Christ. Nobody else. Nothing else. Only Jesus. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Only He can cleanse your life, your heart, and make you whole. Only Jesus. It's still His Word, His truth that changes. It's still what's true and not just some philosophy or some religion or some name on a door. That's not what cuts it. It's still the Word of God. And it's still His grace. And it's still for every person. And it allows the fruit to bear witness of that gospel in your life through an increase of faith, an increase of love, and an increase of hope. It would be very difficult for anyone to stand on this platform this morning and tell you what's going to happen next week. What's going to happen a month from now. We have no idea in our world that we're living in what's going to happen a month from now if the Lord should tarry. None. No idea. You have no idea. I have no idea. But oh, what an incredible assurance and hope that we have this morning because of the miracle the gospel so I open the altar today I open it to anyone and everyone this morning if you haven't experienced the gospel today's the day the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ where you just open up and you give your life to God and say God I, I, I need what I don't deserve I need your grace today I need to experience that wonderful miracle of the gospel I need to experience that this morning, Jesus, where, where I repent of my sins and, God, you forgive me of my past and you don't hold that against me any longer. God, you allow your spirit to fill my life and you change my future and you give me a hope. My faith is increased in you. I walk different, I talk different, I act different. Everything about my life changes towards you, God, and only, and only comes better because of the miracle of the gospel. I open it to everybody this morning that may never have experienced that before. And I also open the altar today to every person that has experienced the gospel. And they're so thankful for it. So thankful for it that God has allowed you to experience that miracle of the gospel. I open the altar now. Would you come? And would you spend some time? Would you spend some time in his presence this morning? Oh, God, I thank you. I thank you, Jesus, for what you've done in our lives. I thank you, Jesus, for the power that is still, still the gospel. The power of the cross. The power of your miracle working of the cross. C.B. Dudley always used to say any more than three services without the cross is too long. The gospel has to be preached, it has to be shared, it has to be ministered to. Every person that can hear, every person that desires, every person that wants to believe in something more than just believing, they want a life-changing experience. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus.